Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and uh, let's do part two of current status of AI, what you need to know. Remember in the last talk, I gave you some really good results on radiomics. I showed you its ability to detect pancreatic cancer with a high degree of accuracy and distinguish cancer from normal gland. I showed you some work we're doing which allows you to grade neuroendocrine tumors. I also mentioned the problem with radiomics. Although the results are good, remember that all the data sets we looked at were Hopkins data. It was done on similar scanners with similar protocols. Although the scanners changed over many years, they were still one manufacturer and our protocol and timing were all the same. Articles have shown that with scanner variability and changes in scan parameters and even the reconstruction algorithm, often the results are variable. There are many articles published that show really good results as long as you look at the 50 cases done at the home institution. The second you have a second set of data, things fall apart. It's always going to be a problem with AI getting started. You develop things in your home environment. Okay? We have ground truth. We know how to do things. We've done things a certain way. But then what happens when you get other data sets? Again, one challenge in training and developing algorithms is you only have your own data. There isn't a generically available pancreas tumors from 10 different scanners or 10 different institutions. That would be the ideal thing. We need to have that available through the ACR or through the NIH perhaps as a better way of doing it. But again, we need to be very, very careful in not coming to conclusions that really don't hold true when you get down to real practice. And this article by Peter Steger makes that point. Radiomics has demonstrated its utility in many studies because of its ability to quantify texture and appearance related properties of volume of interest, augmenting the more qualitative interpretation of the radiologist. The problem has been that these studies have been difficult to reproduce because of lack of standardization and the variation between scanners and methodology. This has stood in the way of broader clinical adoption. Now, radiomics is not unique in this. It shares the challenge with AI in general, but few have found the ability to go beyond simple institutions. Now, there are some programs that have been approved by the FDA. So we're not saying that it's impossible to do. We're saying it's a challenge, but one we need to really work on. There has been work, this article by Bettinelli in radiology, trying to figure out a way of making standardization to help accelerate the discovery process. And his conclusion, based on some of the work they were doing, the agreement of radiomic software varied in relationship to factors that have already been standardized and factors that need standardization. Both dependencies must be resolved to ensure the reproducibility of radiomics features and to pave the way toward clinical adoption of radiomic models. So again, work needs to be done, but we're looking very hard at doing that. And again, the conclusion by Bettinelli, we designed a new investigation scenario in which we demonstrated that despite the ongoing efforts of both the Image Biomarker Standardization Initiative and software develops the developers to standardize radiomics tools, additional efforts are needed to achieve full concordance. Again, what the point that's well taken is radiomics will never be ready for prime time unless it can handle all scanners and various protocols. I'm not saying it needs to do every protocol. We know that even when we read a scan, if the study is done poorly with motion, poor injection, we're not going to expect AI to do well. But we need to, to say that if you do a decent study, radiomics should work. Now, radiomics is one of the things we've been doing at Hopkins. Another thing we've been doing is the Felix Project, which is combining the work from the School of Medicine with the Engineering School, where we've spent the last five years, supported by the Luskarn Foundation, annotating data, thousands of normals and cancers and cysts and neuroendocrine tumors, and then having the computer learn about those lesions and then making predictions. 
So a very labor intensive process and very, very uh, compute intensive. To, to show you what we started with, we looked at normals because the first thing you need to do is teach the computer to find the pancreas, which was our project. And so we hand drew 23 different structures. You can see the images uh, in front of you. It took three to four hours for each of these cases. We had experts doing it and then we had them checked. We taught the computer then to be able to segment all of the organs, including the pancreas, recognizing if you could do all the organs, that will help you with the pancreas. And we created 3D maps of that. By the end of a little over a year, the computer was as good as us. You can see the image, manual segmentation is one of us, and the deep network prediction is essentially identical for looking at the various organs. And here's a good example simply looking at the pancreas. You can see the prediction and the annotation really are one to one. Of course, being able to recognize organs is not the same thing as recognizing cancer. Beginning in year two, we began to look at cancers. The same thing segmented all the images, segmented the pancreas, the duct, and the tumor. And we taught the computer how to recognize pancreatic masses in a range of appearances and a range of um, different sizes. We then developed algorithms, course defined detection was one of them, to allow the computer to be able to find the pancreas and within the pancreas be able to look for any pancreatic abnormalities. And you can see in this example very nicely the image, the deep network prediction in orange is the tumor, in blue is the pancreas, green is the duct, and you can see the deep network prediction was really good. Look how well it defined not only detecting the tumor, but its boundaries and the boundaries of the pancreatic gland, essentially matching the human one to one. And you can see in this example of three cases, we're able to pick up small tumors. Now you could say picking up a tumor is great, but anyone could pick up a four centimeter mass. We're looking at picking up the lesions that people do miss and our sensitivity and specificity was over 90% in this task. Here's just another example. When you look at the image, you look at the labeling, that's us. You look at single phase and multi-phase where the computer is able to find the pancreas and then be able to detect the tumor. The tumor is in red. Let's look at it again. You see the tumor in the Uncine process very nicely shown in this example. And here it is again, just to give you a feel of how good the computer was able to be. We then looked at other things, including looking at ductilitation. Remember the number one miss uh, for people missing a pancreatic mass is seeing a pancreatic duct that's dilated, but no mass seen and not following up on it. Well, we taught the computer to recognize a duct and duct cutoff and then recognize precisely what the tumor is. And you can see very nicely two examples here of dilated pancreatic ducts with tumors proximal to the duct transition. Now what we're trying to do is take this deep learning and take the radiomics and put them together. Can radiomics find what cases have tumor? And then the AI also look for tumor, but use that information to localize the tumor. Imagine 99% accuracy from radiomics and then the same accuracy from AI picking up the tumors. That will be ideal. I don't think you can have the things sitting there separately. In the short term, the answer is yes. Long term, they need to be combined to help us with the most accurate display of the presence of early pancreatic tumors. Now, what are the critical questions? We did thousands of cases, but essentially it was our scanner, our protocols. What about a patient with pancreatitis? We never looked and said, well, well, how will the computer do? Will it be good? We looked at radiomics. Radiomics could distinguish normal pancreas from autoimmune pancreatitis and autoimmune pancreatitis from cancer. But we never looked at AI. Could AI do this? What are the true false positive and false negative rates in outside studies? Again, that's going to be very important. We've done some work with outside scans and the results seem promising. Now, one of the things we need to do is do even better. So let me show you some other work we're doing, and this is with Microsoft. Um, 
A number of years ago, there was a study done, multi-institution, about 840 patients, where um, patients eventually were operated on for cystic pancreatic lesions that were of concern. Now, this was all done by very experienced surgeons, very experienced GI docs, yet at the end of the day, only 40% of the patients really needed surgery. Subsequently, a program was developed called the COMSYS program that allowed a computer program to detect and evaluate these same lesions, and the COMSYS program was about 60% accurate. So it was much better than the human making the decision. So 40 to 60 is a 50% improvement. So again, you could see that tests like COMSYS can be implemented in routine clinical settings, remains to be determined when you can do it, but it does show that perhaps this will become very important. Well, the COMSYS data is public domain data that was done at Hopkins, and we started working with Microsoft. The first question was, what about if you looked at all of this data, could you do as well or better? Now, the thing that data set had was the images, it also had all the lab work. So what could we do? What is the lesion type? Can we determine whether there's a risk of a lesion being malignant? Can we determine whether there's high-grade dysplasia? Can we determine who should or should not go to surgery? Well, Microsoft has developed new techniques. Now we've done this. Uh, we have a, a sign grant with Microsoft. Uh, for the next several years of working together, but they've developed this explainable boosting machine, EBM, which are highly intelligible because they're able to allow you to understand specifically what the computer program is doing. Remember, we speak about black boxes and the challenge with black boxes in medicine. Well, this is more of a transparent or a glass box. EBMs are additive model. Each figure and feature contributes to predictions in a modular way that makes it easy to reason about the contribution of each feature to the prediction. And you may have 50 features to figure out which one's more important. Using these EBMs, we can see the features that the computer uses to make decisions, and we can try to understand why these decisions are made. It will also help us to optimize tests and information to make the computer programs even more specific. This interpret ML is a unified framework for machine learning interpretability, and that speaks about the technique. But again, this glass box technique is something that becomes very, very important because now the accuracy is the same as black box, but we understand what's going on, and people are going to feel much more comfortable if they know how the computer is making the decision. Now, I won't go through this in detail, but here's how the glass box works and how it compares with the black box. But again, the techniques become very similar, but with the glass box, you can add or subtract parameters and see precisely your results. Again, very, very important. Um, this uses techniques like random forests and boosted trees, again, allowing this technique to be very understandable. In terms of predictive power, EBM often performs well and surprisingly well, particularly when you compare it to other state-of-the-art techniques that are black box techniques, okay? Again, it's also very fast and should be easy to use in clinical practice. Now, just to show you, when we use these boosting machines, we look at the prediction of what the computer was doing, what physicians are doing, and now what this new program can do. You can see the mathematics. You can see the GAMs that are being used, the linear functions, and the predictions. We looked at IPMNs. We looked for high-grade dysplasia. We looked for pancreatic adenocarcinoma. We're able to target that as well. We looked at high-grade dysplasia. Remember, if you're taking out a cystic lesion, you don't necessarily want a cancer. 
you want it to be with a high-grade dysplasia before there's malignancy present. We looked at all of the features, and you could see what features allow the computer to make the prediction. It will allow us to get the right lab values, to get the right information, and probably save money because things that we thought would be of value to making predictions, in fact, were not. We're working on this with a model demo. So we're able to do is you'd be able to put the patient's name in, you'd be able to give all of the features. Now, if you don't have all of the features, the computer will calculate what information you have. Obviously, the more features you have, the more information, the more accuracy will be there. If you look at our results, remember I mentioned to you that the humans were 40% accurate and the COMSYS was 60. It looks like we're in the low 90s with this program, which is just spectacular. Could you imagine we're able to tell a patient, we're looking at your lesion, there's a 98% chance it's an IPMN, less than a 2% chance, chance of malignancy. Maybe you don't need to follow the patient. On the other hand, if you say, this is highly concerning for malignancy, I think the surgeon and the patient will be much more happy taking the patient to surgery. And this is something we're working on now, and I think the results over the next couple of years will indeed be very, very exciting. So again, this, this model, looking at all the information from the imaging to the genetics, and as you get more and more specifics, looking at fluid, we will be able to be more and more accurate. So indeed, it's very exciting. So we're looking at this, and hopefully this will be the next step. Again, building on the radiomics, building on the AI, and this glass box technique, EBMs, may be the next great step in allowing us to really put AI into clinical practice. So again, this article by Deschau, despite AI regularly achieving high performance in medical research, the adoption of AI in real cases is limited somewhat by the opacity of the model. The machine cannot explain how it knew and why it got the results, which is often referred to as the black box problem. We're looking at a glass box, and we hope that by using a glass box, people are going to feel more comfortable in doing the technique. And with that, let me stop there, and we'll pick it up in a few minutes. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.